All right, our recording is underway. And my topic for today is about evaluating and analyzing speeches. And I want to use a technique that's been around literally for over 2000 years because it still works and we still use it. But um, you have assignments in this term where you have to read some speeches and one of the essays towards the end of the term is where you have to draft a speech as if you were going to speak to the county school board about a policy. And I think if I give you some of these tools in how we analyze speeches, you can kind of see it uh, from the backside, how we evaluate what is a good speech. And that would go with your ability to analyze speeches from history or to write a speech yourself because the same standards would apply. The same tricks and tools would be useful. So when I was working, writing for newspapers and covering political events, I would have to evaluate the speeches that politicians and senators and candidates would give. And these would be the tools that we would use for analyzing how good a speech was. But the same tools are used when speech writers, which I have done, I've written speeches for other people. These are the tools that we use to organize a good speech, to plan a good speech. So I'm going to give you about 10 things that you can use, but we don't have to use all 10. You won't see all 10 in every speech. So if you attend something or if you watch a speech on TV, heck, if you want to use these tools to evaluate me right now, you could do that because in a sense, I'm giving a speech. But we do look for these kinds of tools to be used. It's sort of like when I'm teaching people how to write fiction. I suggest that they should look back at every page that they write and see if they involved all five sentences. Sometimes we just focus on what we can see or hear, and that's all that gets described in a story. But if you can give your reader something to smell, something to taste, something to touch, you give them more physical involvement in your story. So if we if I'm writing a story about being down at the beach and I just mention the salt water smell of the ocean. Everybody just smelled salt water. So just by using the one trick, I make your brain more involved with my short story. So when we do speeches, we look at using these kinds of techniques because we know over time these things work. This is what makes a speech effective for the speaker and also effective to the audience. So let me get into the actual content. And of course, I will post these slides and a copy of the recording this afternoon so that you have them for reference. But these slides will give you a little list of what some of these important techniques are. But first, I'm going to give you your very first lesson in ancient Greek philosophy. Because we will get these techniques from one of these people, and I want to make sure that you know who we're talking about and keep the players straight. So the first person I would mention is Socrates. You may have heard of the Socratic method. When I was over at Deltona High School, we had a place in the library that they called the Socratic Center which was just a dedicated place where teachers could do question and answer with their students because this was how Socrates taught. He would pose questions to his students. They would give him back answers. He would push them again with a deeper question. And that discussion was how they they learned things. So when somebody is teaching with a question and answer format, if I asked you Tell me the first thing that you do when you sit down to write a paper. And if the first thing you do is put music on in the background or the first thing you do is make an outline or the first thing you do is get yourself a Coke, then we're learning how we settle down to write a paper. 
So Socrates thought this was a really good way to do this by talking back and forth, speaking and listening with each other. But there's a special thing that was going on back in Greece in those days. They didn't have lawyers so that if you had an issue with somebody else, like if the next guy stole your pig or, or something and you wanted to get this straightened out, citizens would make their argument in front of other citizens who would decide who ought to get paid or who ought to get punished. So you can imagine if you knew how to be a good public speaker, you would win your case. So there was this specialty, these people called sophists, who would teach you how to give good speeches, how to make good arguments, but they would charge you money for that. Kind of kind of be nice if I could get paid for every lesson that I give. But the idea that Socrates had was everybody ought to know how to give a speech and hear a speech. So he was teaching for free. And ultimately, the government thought that he was corrupting the youth of Athens by giving out these lessons. So uh, he had to actually commit suicide under a government order. So, yes, somebody who taught for free got killed for doing it. So I, I didn't know that teaching was such a dangerous job until I learned the story about Socrates. So that's one guy just to know about and how it affected speech, uh, uh, speech writing. So his greatest student was called Plato. And he his one of his most famous books is called The Republic. Because we think about America being a democracy, which it isn't, because if it was a direct democracy, everybody would vote about everything. Congress wouldn't pass laws. All the people would vote about the laws. But remember, ancient society was smaller. You had less people. People could gather up. So public participation was more possible. Plato envisioned this idea of what America really is, which is a republic where we vote for people to represent us and we're supposed to be sending our smartest and most honest people to go handle these things on our behalf. And if we don't like what we what they did, we vote for other people who would do better. But the reason Plato is worth mentioning is because the first guy, Socrates, never wrote down any of his lessons. He never wrote any books. Everything he did was by what he spoke to his students and how the students spoke back to him. Well, since Plato had been one of those students, he was the one who wrote all of these down. And so these dialogues, literally what he called them, between teacher and student were what Plato wrote down to collect Socrates' lessons, to show how this question and answer, this speaking and listening, was a really strong way of teaching. So... That's the second person who you may have heard of. But the one we really want to talk about today is Aristotle, who is the student of Plato. So you see, like we got a family tree where this has been handed down from one generation to the next. Well, Aristotle also was a teacher, and he taught uh, a prince called Alexander the Great, who wound up becoming the ruler of essentially the entire known world um, from India all the way over to Italy. He had conquered everything. So if we can learn from the teacher of the guy who took over essentially the known civilized world, yeah, that would be a pretty good coach to study. And Aristotle was not a philosopher who just sat around and thought about things. He studied the real world. He tried to classify plants and animals, and he uh, understood music. He understood physics, and he was really concerned with how the world really works. So even though he produced theories, and we're going to talk about what he did about speech, but the things he produced were about things people could understand, people could use, dealing with reality, not just uh, fantasy and philosophy. So he was very practical. And his three tremendous books that he did about how to persuade people, 
And remember, one of your assignments is going to be to write a persuasive speech. He analyzed the speaker, the audience, and the speech itself. And even at, at universities, when I've taught communications theory, I use these same pieces. Who is creating the message? Who is listening to the message? And then what is the message itself? If you remember when we did an assignment, some most of you have already done it, I think, about writing a letter to a state senator about uh, the legal age to drive a car. You're not just writing a research paper. You're not just presenting information. You're trying to convince somebody to do something the way you want them to. So it's not informational. It's persuasive. And these are Aristotle's original ideas about how to get that done. So you got to understand who the senator is and what motivates him to do something. You got to understand the facts of the issue about driving ages and accidents and costs and fatalities and those things. But you also have to understand yourself that you as a teenage student writing to a politician, how does your character as a student influence what you put in your letter? And how do you think that would influence this senator to make the law the way that you want it? So you got to have all three of those parts. You got to think about you. You got to think about your receiver. And then you got to think about what you're actually going to write or say. So Aristotle, 2,300 years ago, figured out all of this stuff. And we still use it because it still makes good sense. So I want you to have these tools. And it'll help you read speeches. It'll help you write speeches. Here's a little secret tip. Sometimes if you get an assignment to read a speech, you might be able to go on YouTube if it's a modern speech and find a clip of where the person actually gives the speech so you can hear them say it and watch their face in addition to just reading the words. And next semester, there's a particular poem that we have to look at. So it's an assigned reading, but I found on YouTube where this poet was actually performing his poem on television, happens to be from Canada. But I thought if you can actually see the man saying his words, it could even be more meaningful than just reading them on a piece of paper and imagining how it sounds. So that's a secret tip between you and me that if you have the chance, even if it's a reading assignment, but to find where you could watch that scene from a play being performed or watch that poem being performed or watch somebody give a famous speech. I think that adds to your experience, could add to your understanding. You still have to do the reading, but if you can read it while you're listening to somebody actually say it, I think it could even uh, get deeper into your understanding. So let's take a look at what, what some of Aristotle's gimmicks were that you could use to compose or understand a speech. He says that there's three ways that a speaker proves his point over to the audience. And these are the Greek words for it, but we use them in English as well. So logos is the logic of the speaker's argument. So does the speech make sense? Does the first point lead to the second point? Does the first idea support where the second idea is going? So the way that these things are put together, what you start with, what you finish with, these are all true aspects of how to make a strong speech. And previously, you know, um, we had the lecture about openings and closings for writing an essay and what situation you should use your strongest thing at the start of the essay and what is the situation where you should have your strongest thing at the end of the essay. This is what, what Aristotle taught us thousands of years ago, that how you build your argument is part of the correct construction. When we talk about ethos, the second idea, these are, these are the ethics. This is, do I trust the person who is giving the speech? 
Does this person have good character? Do they have a history where we know that this is an honest and smart person, so we should listen to their ideas? Even in that activity that I talked about before, where you're writing a letter to a senator, if you are putting across that you are a student who is active in your campus and you talk to a lot of students, that kind of implies that you're a leader and that you're involved. So I should listen to you more because you're not just one person with an idea. You have represented a lot of people with your idea. So that makes me think, all right, this is credible. I should read this because this person is showing me reasons why I should trust what they have to say. Then pathos is where we get the word pathetic or empathy or sympathy, where we have an emotional connection to somebody else. So if we would like the audience to share our excitement or be happy about what we're happy about or be sad about what we want them to feel sad about so they give money to our charity, we're trying to figure out what the emotional appeal is. So you see, the first one is mental, where you're trying to uh, show reasoning and logic. The third one is emotional, where you're trying to connect on uh, a sensory level with the audience. And then in between, are you a good person? Are you somebody that we should listen to? And if you get those three figured out, you have a strong basis for your speech. Now, let me give you the particular examples that I think are the building blocks of a strong speech as Aristotle explained them. He said that there were five canons, which is another word for rules. It's not a cannon that shoots a cannonball because see, it's spelled with one N, not two. So when we say canon like this, we mean that it is a truth. And he said that there were five of them, that memory, invention, delivery, arrangement, and style were these five great truths. And we say them in this order because it helps people memorize them, because there's the old fable about King Midas, who everything he touched turned to gold. So that way you got a name to attach to these five principles. And I want to talk about each of them and give you an example of a famous speaker who was using them. OK. When we talk about memory. And Dr. King here was a great example of somebody who could deliver a, a speech without having it all written out in front of him. He certainly worked on them and drafted them and revised them. But when he was out there giving his speeches, he knew what he was going to say. And if you watch somebody give a speech on TV, you might see that they have glass plates in front of them or that they seem to be looking slightly below the TV camera, and they're reading a screen that is scrolling by the words of their speech. So they're not actually speaking it, they're reading it. And when we train people to give speeches, we often tell them not to memorize the speech or to read it, but to be able to speak it from an outline instead of having the whole thing written out word for word. OK, here's another secret trick. My slides are my outline. I do not have this lecture written out as 1500 words on a piece of paper, but I can look at the points on these slides and I know what I want to say about them. Dr. King knew what he wanted to say. So as long as he was in the order that he wanted to present it, how he wanted to build up the audience, he could use his brain and his notes and he was good to go. So when you're preparing a speech or looking at a speech, you might be able to see how the author has prepared it to be something that is in easy chunks to memorize, that it's in short paragraphs, or it has distinct beginning sentences for each idea where you can see kind of the outline peeking through the paper. That would be something that you could look for. Winston Churchill, who was the leader of 
Great Britain during World War II was very good at making phrases. And we actually have a, a particular term for that called coining a phrase, meaning you're the first person to make it and people will work off of this phrase that you just invented. And you're probably already familiar with metaphors such as similes where you are comparing one thing to something else. Well, after World War II, the planet kind of got divided into the democratic half and the communist half. And he was given a speech at the University of Missouri, and he said an iron curtain had settled across Europe, which indicated that the geography was split into two philosophies on the east side and the west side. But this phrase, an iron curtain, has been used and reused for the last 70 years since he first did it. In fact, uh, just the other day, I was looking at a documentary on TV that was speaking, and the title was The Iron Curtain. So they still use the phrase because it was such a good phrase. We could look back at Dr. King where he said, I have a dream. And every time people say, uh, keep the dream alive and things like that, they're playing off of the original phrase. So when somebody makes a really cool phrase like that and you can hear it, you can tell that sticks. That could be the title of a song. That's such a good phrase. Professional speech writers know to do that. They're trying to find that hook. So that if you don't remember anything else out of a 30 minute speech, you remember, oh, that good phrase that represents what he was talking about. So that would be something else that you could look for in speeches that you read or listen to. Or you could be trying to stick one into something that you write. So if, if I was doing that letter to the senator about the driving age. What if I said something like. Students need to be driving this conversation. Whoa, I just visualized students driving. OK, so now the priority of paying attention to what students think, what teenagers think about a driving law, that's a big deal. And that phrase just made it stick. So then all your facts and figures about accidents and insurance rates and all that stuff. OK, that supports it, but that phrase is what made it stick. So this idea of invention, creating a phrase that represents the whole thing and gives the audience something to remember, that's a trick that professional speakers know how to do. When we talk about delivery, and President Kennedy was very good at delivery. I mean, he was a good writer to start with, and his ability to write turned into his ability to give speeches. And I think I have said this in previous lectures about about poems that the way they lay on the page, the way that they skip spaces, the way that they have a short sentence after a long one makes the poem look a certain way on the page so that if you have two short lines and then a long one, I really controlled your reading speed by the length of the sentences that I made or the lines that I wrote in a poem or a play. So a speaker can do the same thing in his speech where he makes pauses, where he puts in shorter sentences or longer sentences. That changes your ability to listen to it because the speaker is only revealing his words when he wants to, which means you only get to hear them when he wants you to hear them. So a speaker can build into their script how they're going to speed it up, how their tone might change when they said something that was happy or positive or when they said something that was sad or tragic. And we often think about the beginning of a paragraph. We know that the topic sentence is so important. A speaker will often say that topic sentence of a paragraph louder than the rest of it because what they're doing is giving you a signal that I'm changing ideas, I'm making a new point, or I'm making a new argument. So I'm gonna say that louder. Again, if you've been evaluating me right now, 
you might have heard me have a little bit higher speaking volume when I flip slides because I'm starting a new idea. Let's see if I do it again. Arrangement. President Reagan was very good at the way that his speeches were arranged. He would start strong to get the audience connected with him. This idea of direct or indirect order, I, I told you about this, that when you got to convince somebody, you want to be indirect and build up to your idea that you want them to agree with. If you think your audience is with you and supports you, then you can start with your main point because you're both on the same side. So whether you start with your strongest point or finish with your strongest point has to do with how you analyze your audience. One thing Reagan was very good at was examples. He generally did not put a lot of statistics in his speeches. Instead, he would tell you the story of some farmer in Kansas and why that farmer represented some law that President Reagan was interested in. Or he would talk about people living in a particular country that he felt the United States ought to support. And he would make you hear about the poor person in a bad situation in some country. So he would give you personalized examples and tell stories and incidents. Think about again that um, letter that you wrote to your senator. A lot of you put in a lot of good information about highway safety and accidents in the United States or in Florida, and that's all good. That's all strong. But after a while, all those numbers in the same paragraph can just kind of bury people in numbers. But if you told a story about, I went to school with somebody who was in an accident, and this is what happened. Boom, boom, boom. And you explain a personal story. I get to visualize your friend and what happened to them. And that individual story makes me feel like I know that person through you telling me about them. And now I care about that person and what happened to them. So now I am more interested and I am more convinced to be on your side, maybe, because I got a real person to attach this to. So having statistics is good. Having some personal stories is good. I think I mentioned in the lecture about evidence that a personal example is evidence just as much as an article out of a out of a newspaper or a magazine because they are both true items that support what you're talking about. So a good speaker will mix up both kinds of evidence. But one way to evaluate something is are they just telling me a bunch of stories about people that they know or did they have some statistics and research to back that up? And if it's really good, they've got a mixture. Finally, I want to give you somebody that isn't any kind of politician at all. This is a picture of Lou Gehrig, who, along with Babe Ruth, might have been one of the greatest players ever for the New York Yankees. And he was the record holder for most consecutive games ever played. The guy never took a day off. The first time he got in the lineup to play, he just played every day for years and years and years. Until finally, he came down with a kind of muscular dystrophy that today we refer to sometimes as Lou Gehrig's disease. So when you think about an athlete who is losing control and strength in his muscles, I mean, how much more tragic do you get than that? Somebody that makes his living with his body has his body breaking down. So th they had a day to honor him when he was leaving the Yankees. And the speech was on the radio and the stadium was full of him saying goodbye to the Yankees. And even though he knew he was having this disease that was going to make him not be able to play baseball anymore and was going to kill him young as the muscles in his heart and, and other organs broke down too. 
So not only was he going to have to leave the game, but he was going to die young. He said to everybody, I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth because he got to make his living playing baseball. And he didn't even think it was anything special that he set the record for most consecutive games played. He just thought he was showing up for work like you're supposed to show up for work. So he was a very humble man who in the worst situation thought he had had the greatest life. So the style of his speaking was not Today, we think a pro athlete has a bunch of swag and they talk tough and they're, they're trying to be clever and they're on Twitter and all that kind of thing. This guy just said, you know, I've been dealt the toughest deal in the world and I'm just happy to have had the chance. And I thank all of you people. So his natural character as just a humble, grateful man came through in the way he gave this famous speech. This goes back to what uh, Aristotle was saying about uh, the character of the speaker. So if you're being true to yourself, you're not putting on an act, you're just you're being the person that you are authentically and strong. That will get over. So when people can work into their speech, who they really are, what they really represent, what they really feel, that will automatically make it stronger because they're not being phony. They're not acting. They're just being their, their true selves and telling you what they really think and know and feel about something. So this is this is a quick summary. I mean, I, I spend a whole semester in college teaching just how to write and evaluate speeches. So we could spend 15 weeks on this and I wouldn't be done. But in this little time, now you've got some tools for how to read a speech, how to listen to a speech, and hopefully how to write a speech. And, and those tools will serve you in any kind of persuasive situation. Even if you're just trying to talk your friends into going to the movie that you want to see instead of the one they suggest, you could use these tools to get everybody to go to the movie that you want. Are there any questions about these general ideas, because this is the last of the points I wanted to get across. All right, I, I appreciate the good attendance today. I hope you get something useful from this. I will get the recording processed and I will get all these things posted up later today so that you have them for reference. Thanks for coming and I'll see you at the same time next week.